Well, good evening, Cedarville, and welcome to the pitch 2023. You seem excited, but how are we doing? Yeah, you guys are definitely excited. Perhaps you heard the rumor about a tonight's giveaway. Tonight, we are giving away third generation AirPods as well as a brand new iPad. All you need to do is scan the QR code that will be up top to be entered. All right, with that being said, would you join me in a word of prayer as we begin? Dear Lord, we thank you uh, for this opportunity to be able to showcase um, what is capable with the human mind that you have given us. We pray that everything we do tonight ultimately gives you glory. And last but not least, for all those who have traveled today, we pray for safe travels as they return home. In your name, amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of this semester, Cedarville Startup Society challenged entrepreneurs from all over campus to come up with the best idea that paired with a business plan could be revolutionary. While many entries were entered through a pre preliminary round and eliminations, only six remain. Tonight, we will hear from each of these six ideas as they present to our panels of judges for a chance to win $1,000. So without further ado, let's meet our judges. First up, we have Dan Parrott, who is a VP of General Commission Collective and has also had ventures in baseball as well as real estate. He's traveling from Indianapolis today, please welcome to the stage, Dan Parrott. Our second judge is traveling in today from Tampa, who is the co-founder of Ideal Strategic Partners, which is a venture capitalist firm that helps ventures create revenue. Please welcome to the stage, Scott Moffitt. And last but not least, please welcome back co-founder of Christian Business Fellowship, as well as the executive producer of the Chosen series. Please welcome Mr. Earl Seals. Please welcome to the stage Annie Alexander, which will get our night started. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Um, before we introduce our first contestant, we're gonna check with the judges and see if they have any initial thoughts and expectations for the night. Good to go? There we go. I would just say good luck. Thank you. And to the contestants, good. Yeah, seriously. Seriously, good luck. Have fun. We're not being very encouraging, are we? I'll, 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 I'll give a little bit more than that. Um, really just embrace the moment. This is an opportunity that it's probably something you'll never forget. Everybody's gonna be presenting. Um, be confident, you've all prepared for this. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what, uh, what everyone has to offer. So, thank you. Without further ado, I wanna introduce our first contestant who's an athlete for Cedarville University and has created a way to revolutionize running in the cold. Please put your hands together for Cooper Peterson. Hello everybody, welcome judges. Cooper. My name is Cooper Peterson, and I am a cross-country and track athlete here at Cedarville, like Annie said. And today, I'm going to be presenting on a product that I've been working on since this summer, which is a way to help runners stay warm in the cold, specifically with their hands. So there is a problem with current running gloves. Current running gloves, like the one I'm holding right here, are poorly designed. They have your digits separated, which allows for more heat loss. Our scientists in here will know that as you increase your surface area to volume ratio, there's more avenue for heat loss. And what these gloves do is they separate out your fingers. And even mittens separate out your fingers from your thumb and keep it away from your palm, which makes it much more cold. Another important thing to notice is that natural running form is a lightly relaxed closed fist. 
And running gloves today are made as if you were to run with your hand flat. As a runner myself out in the cold, um, running through the cold fields of Cedarville, Ohio, I know what it's like to have cold hands running. And it's actually, it can be a very painful experience for runners. Oftentimes, or sometimes, runners, if it's too cold, they'll have to get picked up because they can't feel their hands anymore. One thing that I've noticed is that when I do get cold and I'm wearing a glove like this, I will actually take the fingers out of their compartments and I'll put my hand to a fist. And I'll just run and I'll just like flop around like this. And which is kind of annoying. And also it stretches out the fabric of your glove and it's just not a very comfortable position. So what I've decided to do, to do is make my own running glove, which is called gloves, which is a single compartment mitt made out of Polar Tech fleece and a weatherproof material. And all you do is just put your hand in your natural running form with a lightly closed fist and you're good to go. All the digits are together so you have greater heat retention and better running form. The market for running is looking good. Ever since the pandemic, people have been going outside more social distance exercise. And thus, there's been an increase in sporting goods retail. According to Mintel Research, uh, sporting goods retail has increased dramatically since the pandemic and is projected to continue to increase. So I knew my target market was runners in cold climates, but I had to define where was my cold climate. And so what I did to define cold climate was for a specific geographic area, I looked at the average high and low temperatures for the coldest month of the year. And if the lowest temperature, average temperature was below 40 degrees and the average high temperature below 50 degrees, I declared this and defined this as my cold climate. So I mapped the 20 most populated cities in the country that fit this defined range and drew a demarcation line. So as you can see here, the blue dots represent the cities, whereas the red line represents the trend line. And here's my specific geographic range of my target audience. Here's a quick list of the 20 most populated cities in this range with their population and their average low and high temperatures for the coldest month of the year. So my initial target audience for this product is going to be universities, and this is for two reasons. The first is because they're arguably some of the most committed athletes out there. Uh, my teammates, when it was like negative 30 here, they were running out in the cold, um, which is pretty crazy to me. Uh, additionally, uh, schools do buy gear for their athletes, and so we have the ability to put a logo on these gloves, print a logo, so it's a great way to support your athletes by giving them a product they can use and also to support the school. So I want to start first with Christian universities because they often support Christian business, and I plan to make this a Christian business. Additionally, looking at Division I universities, they have more funding for their gear for their athletes. So within that defined geographic range of cold climate, I locate over 1,000 universities, put them on a spreadsheet, and I have them divided by division and location so I can find them when I want to go uh, talk to them about my product. So looking at the college projections, I wanted to find how many college athletes are in my defined cold climate. And taking 1,000 schools, there's an estimated 26,000 cross-country athletes. And so if I acquired 20% of this market, my projected revenue would be about $182,000, which is a good start, but not enough to support this business. So additional revenue streams are required. So my additional target audience would be running clubs and recreational runners. Looking at recreational runners, they make up about 14% of the US population from a 2017 statistic that said there were 47 million in the United States. So I had to find out how many of these athletes are actually in my defined cold climate. And so I looked at the top 77 cities, most populated cities, and found the total population, which was about 37 million. Um, and if you apply that 14%, it gives you about uh, 5.17 million athletes. So if I acquire 2% of this market, that would be about 3.6 million in revenue, uh, which is encouraging because there are other countries such as Canada and European countries that I have not broken into yet. So there are two strategies I have for breaking into the market. The first would be my personal connections here at Cedarville and the cross country team. I've also met several athletes uh, from other conferences. Additionally, I do have some contacts with some Colorado professional runners and I do know the owners of some specialty running stores who would be willing to sell my product. Looking here in central Ohio, there are several universities that do fit my initial uh, audience criteria, including Ohio State, which is a Division I university, and Ohio Christian, which is a Christian university, 
who may benefit from this product. So we've done some testing. I've gotten some initial minimum viable product feedback. Uh, I've been testing on my fellow athletes here out when it's been cold. And actually, everyone who's tried this glove have said that it is warmer than their normal gloves, which is encouraging. As well as regarding comfort, there are no uncomfortable points of rubbing, and it fits your natural running form. So regarding pricing and revenue, uh, made in the USA, my manufacturer is uh, in Michigan. And the total production cost will be between uh, 11 and $13 per unit. Um, we'll be pricing these about between $35 and $40. Uh, this is competitive with the 2022 popular running gloves uh, range that they are being priced for currently, which would give about a profit per unit of 22 to to uh, $27 per unit and a profit margin of 64 to 69%. So I'm looking for is an investment of $1,000 specifically to go towards my minimum order quantity, which will help me to start selling my first batch, uh, make some profit, and put that back into the business. Thank you all for listening. Great job, Levi. I know it was a little scary being up here. Do you have a set that you use personally since you are a professional runner or at least a college student trying to run? I do have a few that I have tried out myself. And do you actually use them yourself? Yes, I do. Okay. And so the obvious, I used to run cross country. Hard to believe this by my current state. However, it seems to me that you would want to actually uh, pick something up sometime, when, like drink something while you're running. How do you do that without a thumb? So the short answer is you can't. But this is because... I'm specifically, my initial target audience is college athletes. And so you're on, you know, between 10 and 15 mile runs in cold weather. The main thing you're doing is just running. And even with gloves that have great dexterity with all your fingers, it's still difficult to tie your shoes and whatnot. So honestly, if you want to tie your shoes, you just have to take these off. But hopefully your shoes are tied well and you won't have to touch very much on your run. But really it's for cold temperatures that... Uh, that will that really get your hands cold, and so this will help you make it through the run. So do you, uh, do you like any other competitive products? Yes, there, well, there are a few competitive products. Um, what distinguishes this product from the other products is the warmth, as well as it has a weatherproof casing. So it's made of PolarTech fleece, which is it's a high quality fleece, and then it has a as a sh we call it like a shield, the outer layer, which would prevent snow or rain from penetrating the glove. Is it one size fits all? No, this would be about a size medium, okay. and so I still have to grade it to a size small and large. What about kids sizes? I've not considered that yet, but eventually, you know, breaking into the middle school market, we we'll probably have to go down a few sizes. Great, thanks. First of all, I want to say you did a lot of things right. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, identifying who your target audience is and, um, you know, what solution you're looking to provide. Um, a couple of quick questions. I, I know that you talked about initial target audience being, you know, collegiate runners. What led you to that conclusion rather than just runners in general? You know, the, the different age ranges. I mean, you're, you're looking at basically a give or less a four-year age range that you're targeting. Um, there's a lot of run. I know people that are 70 years old that run every day. So what, what segmented that, that target market for you? Yes, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, specifically because there is no dexterity, um, these are going to be for runners who are not happy joggers. They're not you know, trying to plug their phone into their headphones or messing around changing music or whatnot. So, like, as a cross-country athlete, you know, you'll have your team of you running out in the middle of nowhere. Um, we're not allowed to have, you know, phones. And so, also, it is my, of my opinion that these cross-country runners that are in the university are more likely to be out in these cold weather conditions than taking the day off because they have to get their workout done regardless. Sure. And one of the things that, uh, that Dan had asked you about, kind of the, the sizing of it, so is it my understanding that the basically the runner's going to have a fist? Is that correct? Yes, it's okay. a lightly relaxed fish. So there's two words when it comes to launching a new product because that's really what, what our company does. About 90% is new products. And there's two words that are just like 
the holy grail when it comes to launching a new product, and that's multi-purpose and universal. So the, the less in terms of SKUs and sizes that you can accomplish, you know, the, the more uh, market elasticity you're gonna have when you enter the market. So I like that you did that. I think what uh, the biggest differentiator would probably be in terms of, you know, the, the, the wrist size. You know, a child's gonna have a different size wrist than, you know, a, a grown adult. Um, when you talk about the $35 a glove, you know, I, I love the margins. You know, we always like to start at about a 60, minimum 60% um, gross margin when you're going direct to consumer because if you go, you know, wholesalers, channel partners, distributors, um, they're gonna take 25, 30, 35 points right off the bat. So you have to have a healthy margin when you start. Were you basically kind of taking what you're landed cost was and just kind of building a margin on top of that? Or what research did you do to really understand that that's what people are going to be willing to pay for it? So I looked at, I believe it was 16 recommended, highly recommended gloves for runners in 2022. Okay. I took the average of those prices and that was about $42 for those 16 gloves. And so I do want to rem remain competitive with them. Okay. And key differentiators between those, you know, I mean, you don't have to name all of them. I'm sure there's a lot, but I mean, Intellectual property is going to be really important because, as you know, you know, starting out with a, a product like this, you know, if you have you know traction out of the gate, there's going to be Nike, there's going to be Adidas, there's going to be Reebok. You have very deep pockets and spend hundreds of millions of dollars on R and D, so you have to have something that kind of protects that intellectual property. What differentiates you most, so that you think you could probably have some intellectual property around from those other competitors that you just listed? As far as I can tell, it's difficult to get a patent because I think it would be considered non, like a non or an obvious like solution because it's making something. I mean, it's taking something that's more complicated and making it simpler. The only way that I can think about it is having a specialized way to sew the product together, and so that's what I have to look into more. So what I would encourage you to do, I know it's just kind of being a judge, but my, my just advice would be to find one key differentiator or mechanism. It could be something, you know, I know that I think Earl was talking about, you know, how do you drink? Maybe finding a way that there's a thumb could come out and you could potentially be able to drink something that just differentiates it and makes it unique. Because if you can tie something in that makes it unique versus what else is on the market, that alone will give you the ability to, to wrap some IP around it. And then if you get some real traction in the market, instead of you knocking on doors of Nike, Adidas, and Reebok, they're going to be knocking on your door. So I think you did a great job, and uh, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, Levi, super solid there, and I would agree with you. You know, there's, first there comes innovators, and then there comes imitators. And so when you come up with something unique, you're going to have to figure out something that creates some uh, utility patents, something down that line, like what Scott was just talking about, something that says, uh, here's my thought, you know, something that's unique there. I think something uh, specifically, even if you're in a, uh, in a competitive market, there's a way to sell a product. Have you thought about marketing strategies? Have you thought about how you're gonna do that? I know you said you're gonna go to the colleges and try to get on the teams. I was talking, I was in Romania coaching someone who had knives. And the first thing he said is, I make these amazing knives. What do I do to sell them? I said, you've got to get on the world stage. The quality of the product you have, uh, he made uh, deer antler knives. I said, they need to get on the world market. So just, I'm just going to give you some encouragement here because I know you have some strategy, but just something as simple as if you figure out some manufacturing strategies, figure out the uniqueness, and then figure out your world platform. And what I mean by that is in today's environment, you can go online and watch how to market your product on Amazon. You, I am all for knocking on doors. I've done tons of that. But the reality is you can be a strategist with a product that also competes. It doesn't have to be absolutely unique. In other words, uh, patented. But if you created something like that and then figured out your marketing strategy to get it in front of a lot of eyeballs uh, with SEO and all that other stuff with marketing, that would help. You could sell. You could sell even if you didn't get the patent. I would just encourage you to think about that. A great job. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Earl just uh, reminded me of it is, you know, I, I know that uh, Dr. Hammond, we've talked about this on, on several occasions. Um, our organization, uh, my company, we utilize the, the lean startup model, which I know he has all of the, you know, the students read and, and early on. And so initial small, small batch manufacturing, right? It's, it's challenging to do because most manufacturers want very large orders, but, you know, small batch, 
get that into the market, get that feedback, build that intimate relationship with your consumer base and continue to evolve over time. You know, you, the, the iPhone 14 is nothing like the iPhone 1, so you can continue to evolve. The only last thing that I, I had a note here and I meant to mention before, you talked about selling to, to schools. Um, I would highly recommend direct to consumer start and consumer being the runners, not the schools. For any business or a retailer or school or university, for anybody, any organization to adopt a new product or solution or technology, they want to see a proof of concept, meaning they want to see sales, they want to see consumer reviews, they want to see brand recognition before they implement something and adapt something into their organization. So selling direct to the consumer and really pinpointing who that consumer is, age range, gender, geographic location, income level. I mean, I know you're talking about students, so you have a, I think you have a very segmented market. I would just kind of explore of ways to really pinpoint who that market is, sell to them, big the, build the proof of concept, and then look to scale it into uh, to distribution. Thank you. Cooper, we're out of time, but I wanted to challenge you with a couple of things. The coolness and neatness of the hypoallergenic fabric that you're using and how easy it is to wash and dry and how that it doesn't get stinky and moldy. And then secondarily, think about how you're building a running community around your gloves. Right? Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you, Cooper. Um, judges, do you have any concluding thoughts for the audience? Um, yeah. We're running out of time, so we can go to the next one. I need about 30 seconds to compile my thoughts on this sheet. Okay, perfect. Well, our next um, contestant is from Dubai, and he is going to present an idea that can potentially save countless lives. Um, if you guys could put your hands together for Elbin Augustine. According to the World Health Organization, drowning is the third leading cause of unintentional deaths all around the world. Now, in America, we have about 6,500 people that die of drowning every year, with 70% of this number being drownings in beaches and in coastlines. Now, this is a large number, but the issue of beach-related drownings is not just an American problem. It's a problem that extends globally. If you look at this chart, America has a significantly low drowning rate relative to the rest of the world, as it's shown in gray. And you can see countries with higher rates of drowning in purple, green, and in red. Now, before we go into the issue of beach-related drownings and how we can potentially address this, I would like to define a few terms. First being the lead time. Lead time is known as the time from which the lifeguard notices that a person is drowning and the time to when the lifeguard gets to the person that's drowning. Now, it's integral that we reduce this lead time as the average person will go under in one to four minutes. Now, what are some of the existing solutions that we have? Well, we have kayaks. They're cheap, but they're slow. And it's not the best way, as you might have crowded beaches like this, which make it just hard to maneuver through. Now, some lifeguards swim, but again, if the tides are high and if the beaches are crowded, it just makes it really hard. The third method that most beaches use are jet skis. Jet skis, even though they're really quick, they're very expensive. They cost about $20,000 to maintain a year. And if you use them in high pressure situations, you cannot expect all the people in crowded beaches like this to just move and let you to perform your rescue operation. So it, it brings in the potential of much more casualties as you will have people that will be in the way or just unsafe conditions during rescue. In addition to that, 
Jet skis cannot be docked in the water and they have to be parked on land. So you, you will need two people to like move the jet ski in, all of which increase the lead time, which is crucial when we look at the aspect of saving people's lives. Now, what am I proposing? Well, what if we could use a drone to take a drone, I mean, what if we could use a drone to drop two CO2 inflatable life buoys at the drowning people? Basically, how this works is when it comes into contact with water, it inflates. So, I went through some of the concepts and sketches, and I finally decided that I liked the claw releasing mechanism, so I decided to stick with that. I developed my design in Fusion 360, and then I CAD modeled some designs, and I've decided to come up with this design, as you can see on the screen. Basically, the key features are that they can hold four life buoys, and each clock can release two life buoys to the people that are drowning. Um, yeah. The claws have cutouts, which allow for airflow that can go through it, so just, which helps reduce drag and just makes it a more aerodynamic design. Um, I have taken inspiration from the GoPro um, as they have solid mounts, so it just makes it more secure and allows for easy attachment and detachment. Now, this are some more like CAD model sketches, and this would be an exploded view of my the electronics in my housing. I'm going to be using a lithium-ion battery and a Circuit Playground Express board, which basically, the key feature of this is that it has a light sensor that can detect the changes in the opacity of the light. So when the, life, oh, so when the, when the lifeguard notices that a person's drowning from the camera uh, that will be in the drone, he can change the opacity of the light. And when he changes the opacity of the light, he can um, then when he changes the opacity of the light, the light sensor in the Circuit Playground Express will detect this change in the light and thus trigger the servo motor to move and drop the inflatable um, CO2 life buoys. Now, um, looking at value proposition, what I'm looking to achieve is that we can bring about an increased safety in beaches through quicker rescue times and thus overall lower our fatality rates of drowning. Um, this will also bring about a more significant confidence in lifeguards and thus safer beach conditions. Now, my business model. Initially, I'm looking to um, address and target the Department of Safety of different municipalities. And then my secondary target audience would be the fire departments and coast guards. For my method of production, I'm looking to start at CW University. I've already spoken to Dr. Cole, who is a DLD prof here. Uh, and he's a senior design, um, senior professor of computer engineering, and he is willing to help assist me with small scales of production. And then after that, I'd be looking to go to Ohio State and then find another supplier. Um, now, in terms of my market size, there are about 6,400 beaches in America. And now, if we just attain about 40% of that market, which, which would be, oh, it's, it's not there, but 40% um, of the market would be about 2,600 beaches. Um, and if we can sell three units to each of the beach, we're looking at about 6,800 6, units. And oh, sorry, 7,800 units. And if we can sell 7,800 units, we're looking at about $936,000 in sales. At which with our costs being at only about 195,000. So with this model, we're looking at about a 80% profit margin. And this is assuming that we can sell my uh, unit at about $25 per unit if we produce 1,000 units. Um, right now, if I had to produce a unit, I'm looking at about a $40 cost per unit, but if we can sell 1,000 units, we're looking to bring down costs significantly less, and if we can increase the number of units they want, we can bring this cost significantly, significantly lower. Now, this is just America. And from the start, I talked about how America has a significantly lower drowning rate than the, than the rest of the world. So if we have a global strategy and we can use this model, we can take this product to the rest of the world and help save a lot of lives. Because this isn't just a product. This is a way to save lives. Thank you.
Thanks for sharing that. That was cool. You know, there's products that interrupt the market all the time. And just conceptually, I think it's a great concept. In other words, boats, jet skis, all that type of stuff, but you've got a drowning individual. What's the easiest way to get to them uh, quickly? I can see, especially in today's environment, we know how impactful drones are or are becoming. It's changing the world, really. So I'm just going to start with that. Conceptually, great idea. There's some math that probably is a problem. I'm thinking about $120. How do you create a drone that does that? Should it be inflatable? The challenge there is that, of course, you have to. it actually has to work when it lands. Or I'm just dropping something on top of them to help them drown. So is there a way to create something that's a solid state unit that you can drop versus having an inflatable? You're also looking at the, the time to get out there. You're not looking for a drone that's going to necessarily go out and I need it to fly for 30 minutes. If I'm uh, in a, a tower and I can see that someone's drowning, it's more of a flip of a switch, get the drone going, get it out, get the, the solid state float, floating material out to them, whatever that may be, and then uh, a buoy, whatever it is, and can I drop it effectively without one more hiccup in the process, which is now it has to blow itself up. So I would say conceptually it's a great idea. Uh, I would, the mathematics, I'm not quite connecting on $120 for all of that unless you have a something to do with drones that I'm certainly just not aware of. Yeah, so I'm not selling the drone. I am selling an attachment to a drone. So you can use that on any DJI drone, and that's why we're only Okay, so you're using DJI. I yes, get it. DJI is the most common drone. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, so you're just you're talking about the, the manufacturing part up there was something that you're designed to attach to a DJI. That's $120, and then possibly something to go along with that. Yes, and that includes the cost of the CO2 inflatable life buoy. And I'm not designing that. That will also be outsourced. And later on, if we want, we can work with, a, with the company and strike a deal to help bring the cost down. Got it. Dan? Great. So it does include four life vests? Yes. Each unit can drop four life vests, great. yeah. So let, let me say great, great job, great idea. You know it's being done already, right? Life vests are being dropped out of drones already, right? I didn't know that, but... Yeah, so in Fort Walton Beach a few weeks ago, I actually saw a video of that. What, that's part of my question is not to say you didn't know that. Part of my question is to say, is your claw better than their claw? Is that what you're saying? Um, what I'm trying to achieve is... Yeah, I'd say, yeah. I would say um, the design of the claws and the ability to throw four down would make it more unique. Okay. Because if you just have one dropped, um, it yeah. would not be as ideal. I agree. That's a good idea. Clever. Good idea. Yeah. What about liability insurance? And now talk about overhead a little bit. So you got liability insurance because this is a drowning person, right? And then yeah. secondarily, talk a little bit about most national parks require a permit to fly a drone and even prohibit it. Have you addressed that at all? All right. So each lifeguard will have to have an FAA license. Yep. And we'll, we'll work around that with the municipalities. And okay. it's not hard to get an FAA license. So if e each of them is certified in like a few seconds, they can fly that down there. And now in term, and then the other question? Most maybe? national parks ha prohibit drones flying. How will you get around that practice? National parks? Yep. This is for beaches. Which many are in a national park. Oh, yeah. If you mm. considered it, great. If you didn't, I just wondered if you considered it. No, I didn't consider it as yep. being You're national good. parks. Good idea, thanks. Thank you. So first of all, I want to say the last thing that you said um, was music for my ears. You know, it was, it, this isn't a product, it's a movement, right? And when you can attach a movement to something, you know, people can create products all day long, but when you attach a movement, I've always had in the school of thought that if, if it saves one life, then it's it's worth its weight in gold, right? And so I, I like that you're attaching a movement to it, so that's from a positive side. Um, you also identified the problem. You started by identifying the problem. I had some questions as far as what you were identifying. You know, the, the map that you showed showed a lot of... Um, a lot of areas that were not surrounded by water. So when we're talking about drowning, um, I would, I don't know the statistics, but I would think that a large amount of drowning happens, you know, with children in pools. And I'm not sure that that's, you know, if those statistics were taken into account in your data, that's, um, maybe they were, maybe they weren't, maybe you can answer that. Let me phrase it in a question instead. Um, do you, do you know, based on your data, what, what segment of that are at beaches? Cause your product is clearly designed for beaches, right? So, yeah. So, my product is mainly designed for beaches, as you said, and I said 70% of that, of 6,500 drownings um, in the U.S. are uh, beaches and coastlines. So that's the target 
that's the market that I'm looking to target. And it's estimated that there's about 100,000 beach and coastline related drownings all, all around the world. So I'm trying to reach that market and every life saved is significant, so. Okay. So when you're, when you're thinking about approaching, you're, go, you're basically trying to sell into the public sector, right? I mean, you're, and, and I'm gonna let you know, <laughs> speaking from experience, very, very, very difficult. A lot of red tape, um, a lot of pencil pushers, a lot of people who you know, don't make decisions in a timely manner, and um, I don't know, last time anyone's been to the DMV, but perfect example. Um, just from my experience, selling into the public sector is a real challenge. So what you're trying to do, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you're trying to get them, first of all, to buy drones, which they may not already, they may or may not have. You know, I don't know if they do or don't, but if they don't, they're going to need to purchase drones. And then they're going to need to get the licensing for, their, for these people to, to be able to have the FAA certification. And all of those things have to happen for them to buy the product. So it just seems to me as if there's a little bit of a high barrier to entry. Um, I like that, you know, look, again, saves one life, worth its weight in gold. Um, I love the passion. It's clear that you did your research on it. Um, but those, those would be my concerns. Great. No more questions for me. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Elvin. Can we hear it one more time for Elvin? Judges, I'll ask again if you have any concluding thoughts. If you're all set, I'll introduce. Oh. There is actually one thing I wanted to add, and I, I meant to say this before, and it was um, the first presenter as well. Um, we, like my company, 90% of what we do is product based, and I, I can tell you I am red, white, and blue through and through, and I wish that we could manufacture everything in the United States. I wish to God that we could. The reality of the situation is that. The, the numbers don't align. I wish they did. Uh, but when we're starting to look at kind of the cost of goods sold and, and the COGS and we're hearing people that are talking about, especially electronics, to, to have electronics made in the United States is minimum of 10 times what it would have to make overseas. And so as much as I want to keep business and keep everything in the United States, when you're launching a successful business, you have to take numbers into account. So I would just encourage people to, you know, just really weigh those options and, um, that would just be my, my two cents on that. Thank you so much for that. Audience, who appreciates clean bathrooms? Woo! I know I do. Um, our next contestant is John Stevens, and he has a way for us to find the cleanest bathrooms in town. Cedarville. All right, I'm pumped to be here. So my idea is the Royal Flush. Get the scoop before you poop, okay? I'm all about a good, clean bathroom. When I go, I want it to be clean, clean only. So, hey, for real, I feel this sometimes. I'm not gonna lie with you. So let's keep going. All right, let's get into it. Everybody in this world has one thing in common, is that we need to go to the bathroom. Everybody has to do it. And to tell you guys a quick story about me is, I had to go on a beach trip last summer and uh, it was my best friend Toby and you know, we wanted to drive all the way through it, no stops, you know, seven hours, no stops. We wanted to get to it. And I was crying halfway through it because I had to go. I felt the pain in me and Toby's yelling at me like, nah, we're not stopping. And we had nowhere to go because we were just going straight. We didn't know where rest stops were, we didn't know where gas stations were, we just kept going. And he tossed me a Gatorade bottle. I'm not gonna go into detail, but it wasn't good, it was, it was pretty bad. So, you know, when on a road trip, sometimes you guys, eat, you guys eat snacks, you guys drink some drink, and all of a sudden you get a tummy ache. We all, all, you guys know what I'm talking about, okay? And you guys need to go. So that's where we come in, the Royal Flush. That's how we're gonna help. All right, our mission, we don't want it just to be an app. 
We want to be an app to your body's needs, okay? We want to help you guys out. So what we do is we find bathrooms near you. That means rest stops, gas stations, and even shopping centers. So, and we'll also go on a five poop scale, meaning five, it's beautiful, it's clean. You can just pop a squat and you can go. One means probably do not want to go there. You know what I'm saying? Probably don't want to go. Okay, so let's keep on going. All right, why can the Royal Flush help? If you guys didn't know already, there's portable urinals selling on Amazon that people are buying and people are bringing gallon jugs in their car just to go to the bathroom. And I don't know about you guys, but I kind of don't want pee in my car when I'm driving. There's a stench, okay? We all know it. We, don't, we can be big boys here. And you know, it's kind of gross. It's not kind of, it's really gross, you know? It's pretty bad. So that's why I want to help, okay? The bathroom industry is a complete joke now. Bathrooms are more dirtier than ever. It's, I hate it. Um, one bathroom we went to, I actually mopped the ground because when I walked, I slipped everywhere for how greasy it was. And no one understands that a quality bathroom means a quality excess of your bowels, okay? And that's what I wanna do. You know, I wanna help out. It's a proven fact that germs pile up in a bathroom over and over again. And with COVID breaking out, it's just more and more germs on germs, okay? And that's not good. I want a clean bathroom to where I can go and I don't have to feel gross at all. So how do we fix, fix this? We build an app that rates bathrooms that we don't just rate, we do, but you guys also help us by downloading the app. Everybody, every business likes five stars. They wanna know that they did a good job and that they're rated good. And if a one-star bathroom gets rated on the Royal Flush, they're gonna to start to take notice and notice that, man, maybe I need to make my bathroom cleaner, which they do, because bathrooms are gross and they need to be cleaner. So, and we wanna profit. And if business profited with us, you know, work with us, they can profit too. With people comes profit. If a person shows up to their gas station, you need to go to the bathroom that they found on our app, boom, the gas station profits too and we profit from it. So, we have a 10% profit margin going on right now. The average app in 2022 made about $80,000. We're pushing to do 82,500 as a rating app. So let's keep on going. Things to get more money is that you can pretty much make a pro version out of any app. So that's what we wanna do. We wanna be able to do ad revenue too. And by doing a pro version, you can delete the ads. That will give us money as well. And businesses can also partner with us to make their bathroom cleaner. And if you didn't know, in China, they actually rate their bathrooms to see if people will come to it. And if, we had, and if you just had a five-star bathroom, little sign on your thing, people are gonna go to it. So the cons, this app might not work. That's a con to every single app out there. It's just, it may not work. And with the best reviews here, it comes with time. And time is what we need, and that's okay. And we can't cover every single bathroom in the world, but I will show you in the app that I have the prototype, you can put, download an app, I mean, download a bathroom to it. All right, now let's keep going. So pros, you get to release your body's needs. That's what, that's our goal. And you have an app that tells you where bathrooms are located, which is better than just text, typing on your phone, nearest bathroom, whereas you can just open an app and it gives you a 10 to 20 mile radius of all the bathrooms that are near you. So. You can find cool gas stations, stores, and rest stops that have the cleanest bathroom and the best snacks. Because I know with the road trip, I love good snacks and good drinks. And it's always quick and easy to use. So let's look at the app. Right now we have the login screen, the create account screen. You can see they're pretty similar because it's that easy to use. You know, log in, password, get started, add an email and add a password. And right there you can see we have all the bathrooms right there. We also at the top have all the, where a bathroom is located and there's stars and how you can get there is from Google Maps. So, and there's a profile account. Of course, that's my name, that's John Stevens. Um, and you can edit profile, do all that stuff. And right there, as I said, mentioned before, you can add a bathroom to where you can take a picture of how it looks, you can add the bathroom's name, and you can put the location in there for other people to find it. So, and you can also rate a bathroom on a three right there. You can rate it and comment. And we did do a prototype at the great store Bucky's in Kentucky. And let's read what it says. Greatest bowel movement in my life. This bathroom was clean and I felt comfortable. 10 out of 10, would poop again. Okay. And guys, if I saw a comment like that, I would for sure go to that place. 
And that would be just great if I saw that comment all the time because then you know that's a clean bathroom. And that's what I wanna do here. It's just make a clean bathroom for everybody. Thank you all for listening. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot revolving around critical mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody knows anything about apps, you're going to have to have a, a, the download is the big key to that, right? Yes, There's right. only a million of them. I don't know what to say. I don't know <laughs> if this is a crappy idea or not. Hey. Oh, there, I just don't know. I, I would say that McDonald's, we know that the part of their uh, founding principle was the clean bathroom, which allowed, that really attracted people to come there. Not necessarily for the food, but with the kids and the clean bathroom. So there's something there. Yes, sir. Uh, I think Google Maps and the fact that if I'm that desperate as you were, I would probably have stopped. And I, yeah, I guess it's different for each person. I, yeah. <laughs> Some people care about that a lot more than others. That's all I'm saying. So I don't, I don't know what I have to say a whole lot more other than it was uh, uh, interesting idea. <laughs> yeah, are you at MVP now? What'd you say, sir? Are you at MVP now, minimum viable product? Uh, no, sir. We're still at the prototype. It has bugs and everything. So we're still working on it. Is it developing happening in the States? Sir? Is it development happening in the States? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, tell, me, tell me a little bit about your product project progression. So how are you? Do you understand my question? Yes, sir. Okay. So right now we started it here. And uh, we downloaded the app. It's still a little glitchy as due to a prototype. But it is working. We have it downloaded to places that it has tracks around here that we've even gone to and just created and reviewed and commented. And so far, it is working pretty well. It just still has a little bit of bugs. And it still needs to be uh, tweaked out a little bit. All right, tell me a little bit about your revenue stream. Revenue stream is 82,500. It's not good. It's just an app, you know. I'm just, it's just what I got so far. What, what are the different streams? How do you get income? Uh, through ad revenue and through making it a pro version. Obviously, if we have ads, that would also benefit to us because people are trying to put their platforms onto it. And also with partnership, it can come through. So what's your end game? Are you going to sell it or are you going to grow it? Uh, probably sell it. What's yep. your runway? Sorry? What's your runway? I haven't thought that far out, sir. Good. I love your presentation. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're very charismatic. <laughs> uh, you have... Uh, you have a great presence, and, uh, and you, you communicate and articulate yourself very well. Um, you talked about a 10% profit margin. Uh, explain that to me, because I'm, I'm wondering what, what is your you know, outgoing expenses on a monthly basis versus what are you bringing in? How so that... the 10% profit margin just came from ads all around the 22 year and how much they did. Because as a rating app, you can't really get a distinct one till it's out and it has time to be rated. So we kind of just took the average of everything. We got a solid ten percent. So you're on test flight? Are you in? Are you are you on test flight? Or are you? Yes, in sir. The, right now we are. You're on test flight. So or do you actually have it in the Apple Store or or Play Store yet? Or is it? No, still... sir, not yet. Okay, so um, maybe I, I just misunderstood the, the eighty-two thousand five hundred. You've done eighty-two thousand five hundred. No, sir. Okay. That's the average. Uh, okay, rate got it. Okay, I, I was curious about that. Um, I'm actually really familiar with this on on mm. a couple different levels. So. We've, um, we, we've, yeah, I know, I know. Um, we've, um, so I've been a part of a launch of um, uh, a cleanliness, uh, location cleanliness rating, uh, not specific to bathrooms uh, application, uh, did pretty well. COVID has obviously uh, heightened people's awareness uh, to, you know, clean facilities in general and um, some other projects that we're currently vetting and I can't really speak to those because of confidentiality, but um, some projects that we're vetting are specific to restroom cleanliness, and one, the statistics are um, pretty overwhelming that people are very unlikely to revisit a place if it doesn't have a clean restroom. Uh, shopping times at retail stores uh, greatly are limited if the restrooms aren't clean. Um, so I, I definitely see the value in it um, in terms of you know, being something that's important. I'm not sure about people downloading the app itself and, and that being a, you know, a, a, a salient point in terms of why people would, would download the app. And, you know, if you're going on a road trip or just locating a clean restroom, um, 
I've experienced the same problem I think everyone probably has. So I, I, anytime there's a problem, there's, there's definitely a mousetrap, there's a solution. So um, I like what you're doing. Um, I'm not sure you know, how, how it's going to work out, but I like you. So I, I appreciate well done. that. <laughs> All right, we good? Great. Appreciate it. Thank you, you for sharing. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. I am definitely curious to know what would be the highly, highest rated bathroom at Cedarville. Um, judges, do you have any concluding thoughts? All good? Um, next, I am going to introduce Eve Wellner, who is going to pre um, present the winner of the first prize, Apple AirPods. all of you have been waiting for, the winner of the Apple AirPods. All right, it is Jennifer Britton. Jennifer Britton, you can come right down to the stage here. Jennifer Britton. Oh, okay, you can come right down here. Congratulations, you're the lucky winner. All right, and then I'll invite Annie to come back up to the stage. Thanks, Eve. Congratulations. Are there any worship majors or worship leaders in the audience today? Yeah. <laughs> well, wait until you hear this new idea. I'm going to introduce Willem Vandermage to show you it. Hello, everybody. My name is Willem Vandermage, as Annie said, and I am pitching the Midian Prime. So just a little bit about me. I am from Geneva, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, and I'm a junior here at Cedarville University. I am getting a major in computer engineering, and I'm getting a minor in entrepreneurship. So the problem. Small bands and lone performers need a reliable, inconspicuous way to cue backtracks, pad tones, and anything else. What does this look like? If I'm a lone performer that goes and sings at restaurants, a lot of times I'm gonna have a track behind me playing the music that I'm singing over. And I don't have a sound person there to cue that for me. I need to do it for myself while I'm performing. If I'm a worship leader of a small band at a church and we don't have a sound person, again, I need to cue tracks in your clicks while I'm performing. So here's a current solution that is being used today. And there are some problems with it. So to begin, it is a foot switch box that you can send MIDI signals to a computer with. MIDI is a common um, interface used in the music industry to interface with computers. And some problems with this device are first of all that it's wired. You connect this with a USB cable and that's just really inconvenient, especially if your laptop is really far away from your computer. You're gonna need a really long USB cable. Additionally, it is pretty conspicuous. It's pretty obvious that you have this box lying right in front of you as you're performing. And it's also expensive. That box is $100 for three switches, aluminum box, and a USB interface. And finally, it is unintuitive. And by this, I mean that you can't use it blind very easily. Even though one button is raised more than the others, you typically have to look. So when you go like that, it's not ideal because you were looking at my face and then my face looked at my foot and you started looking at my feet. And I don't want you looking at my feet, I want you looking at me. I wanna maintain that performer audience interaction. And when I have to do something awkward with my feet, I lose that. This is why the Midian Prime is a better solution. The Midian Prime is a wireless, inconspicuous MIDI controller that can be clipped on different parts of the body, such as a guitar strap, a pocket, a back pocket, a belt, anything that's most convenient for the performer. So let's get into more of the product details. So I have a prototype here. This is a 3D printed model of what it would look like. It is two and a half times larger than the actual product would be. It just makes it easier for everybody to see it. So 
is what we're looking at right here. We have four buttons on the front. In reality, it would be this size. And so looking on here, we have the four buttons. This one right here is what would be the mode button. You wanna be able to send more than just four signals. So you hit the mode button, the mode changes, and you can send going from one, two, three, hit the mode button, mode two, now you're sending four, five, six. Hit the mode button, mode three, seven, eight, nine. To tell what mode you're in, you have a little light right here, as well as a display that tells you what mode it is. It is also a wireless device that will connect to a computer via a USB receiver. This is beneficial when compared to something like Bluetooth. You don't wanna to have to rely on the laptop's Bluetooth capability or reliability. So by using a custom transmitter, you can do a much better job of having a reliable connection that can go much farther distances. Additionally, it'll take AAA batteries, so you can see where we have the battery slot right here. The benefit of that is when you're performing, you don't wanna have to worry about having to recharge something. You don't have time for that. You just wanna be able to pop it in, pop in new batteries, and get after it. It can operate on all 16 MIDI channels, and we also have the mounting clip right here, so you can put it wherever you want. And there's also a battery indicator on the device, so you know if you're running low on battery. So next, for the market. The audio equipment market is very nice in that it has high margins. Uh, buyers of audio equipment are much more likely to spend significant amounts of money on equipment than other market groups. And this is often because they're also a niche market. There's not too many customers that could be buying this product. Doing some market research, I found that there are about 18,000 professional musicians and singers in the US and about 3,000 worship leaders. So that does not include often people that do it on the side, but that's still not a great amount of people. And I would estimate about 2,000 would be the initial market size. Additionally, the audio market is pretty fragmented, which is beneficial. It's open to new players. There's not just two dominant players that basically crush all the competition, but if you can have a niche product that solves a real need, then you can perform rather well. And it's also a growing market at about 6.1% compound annual growth rate. Next for the strategy, production can begin in-house. Nothing about this device is too complicated. The only custom parts are a PCB board, which is what you put the electrical components onto, and also the outer casing, which can be hand injection molded. Sales can begin on Amazon, so you don't have to make an entire new website or deal with hassles of that. Additionally, ads can be run on Google for keywords such as wireless MIDI, clippable MIDI, that could then point to the Amazon page. The conversion will be via the innovative features of this product. The value proposition is that it is inconspicuous and more convenient than the solutions that are currently out there. And so by capitalizing on this, we can take the customers from seeing the product to actually converting and paying money for the product. And finally, growth can primarily be done via new products. So then finally, for the financial projections, the expected development cost is only about $2,000. This is not that complicated of a device and can be created for minimal money and minimal time. The target production cost is about $20. The target sale price is about $70. So we would be getting 71% margins at about 50 bucks per unit. So then looking at the different cases of units sold at only 100 units sold, you would be looking at about 5,000, which is still more money than you put in. Not great, but a base case would be $25,000 with um, 500 units and then 2,000 units would yield $100,000. So these aren't huge numbers, but this is a product that solves a real need and can be accomplished with minimal initial cost, minimal initial effort, and uh, minimal personnel to get it executed. So thank you for listening, and remember that it's prime time. Well, um, I can sense your enthusiasm, so that's great to see. Clearly you're involved in music. I am not in any way. So you're gonna have to help me understand this. I understood the part with electronics, push the buttons, change the unit, you're changing the outputs or whatever the case. What are you controlling with the unit? The speakers, the music, what are you doing? So on your laptop, a lot of times you'll have a software that takes the MIDI signals. And so MIDI can be done over USB wirelessly. Um, just a, a lot of different things. It's a standard that's been around since the 80s. So kind of like old keyboard standards like PS2, a similar thing to that. And it's just transitioned to being over 
uh, different modern protocols. And so you will have a software on your computer that specifically will be reading those signals, and then you can program that software to do specific things. So a lot of times if you see larger bands, they might have a person on stage with a MacBook trying to trigger different things, and then that would be that person. But if you're small enough that you don't have a person to do that, then that's when you need to trigger it yourself. So really, it sounds like the key to this is the software. The, the software is pre-existent by other people, so this just interacts with the software. It sends the signals that the software recognizes. Very interesting. Because I see this all the time, and where people are trying to get the song to start or the song to stop, or in your case, you're up on stage and you're singing, you're saying, hey, I want to just pause for a minute. You want to talk to the crowd, but the music continues on. The guy in the back doesn't know what you're doing. When do I start? All that type of stuff. You're saying you could independently control that. So yes, this would be done by the performer to actually send the signals. It's a great idea. I don't know if the market's big enough, like you said, so, but yeah. Awesome. It's functional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I might say good job, too. I really like, like what you're thinking. I can't wait to hear what Scott says. <laughs> I cannot wait. I mean, his, this is his power alley for sure. Um, help me understand how you go from wireless, from wired to wireless, but you only have one end of the wireless now. So th there would be another end that will be sold with it. I don't have an example here. And so kind of imagine when you have a wireless mouse with a dongle, yep. it's kind of that uh, system. Yep. However, instead of being a dongle, you'd have something yep. a decent amount bigger, so maybe like two inches long. Yep. That would be able to send a more powerful signal so you can get a more reliable connection. And even though it's decently sized and not just like a tiny thing or that you don't have anything at your computer, the computer is not really moving during this, nor is anybody really using the computer at the moment. So that's not a huge deal that it takes more space, but the reliable connection is a really big benefit. Are you going to bundle those products, or am I just supposed yeah, to Yeah, those would be sold together. Okay. That's all I got, Scott. Can't wait. So I actually think this is a pretty a, a large market. Um, you, you, you said pretty niche market. I, I think it's a lot larger. You, you're looking at kind of worship leaders and, and teams and... Um, you know, professional musicians, and I think it goes way beyond that. I mean, you, you go to you know, restaurants, anywhere that they have live music, you go to any major city, you go to New Orleans, and you'll find 50 places within three, you know, three blocks that have live music. So I think there is a, a really good-sized market for this. Um, my initial thought as you started, great presentation, by the way. I want to start by saying that. Um, as you were going through it, um, I really thought, you know, as you were listing all the benefits and features Right, I felt like it was, um, the first thing that came to mind is this is a Rolls Royce, right? Like this is basically something where, you know, you're, when, you, when you first start to solve a problem, when you need to educate a consumer, we live in, an, in a, a society where people want to understand something right away, and, and if it takes too long to educate the consumer, you lose the attention span. You know, a fly flies by, a you know, kid comes in the room, they're gone, right? So the, the least education, and, and I, I would really just encourage you to kind of back up a little bit in terms of looking at an MVP, solve that initial problem, but don't solve what you think the problem is. Solve what the market validates. There was a few things that you talked about. Um, you know, you said high margins. Based on what? I, I didn't see any data. I didn't see any, 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 any examples. I mean, when we're talking about high margins, I, I don't know, is, is that an opinion? Or are there, are there, is there data to support that? I just, all I would say is, is that when you're going to make, you know, sources, when you're going to make those claims, just be able to kind of back that out. And, and, and you, you could be 100% right. I, I don't know one way or the other. I just would like to see some data to support that. Um, another thing just to, to mention in terms of as you go through, you know, really the, the specs and the differentiators is I think one of the most common mistakes that entrepreneurs uh, make when it comes to launching a new product or product-based business is they go based on what they think. They go based on what they think is the right solution or what they think the problem needs to be solved and how it should be solved. What, what the, the, the founder thinks, what I think, what Earl thinks, what Dan thinks, uh, unless we are the epitome of your part, target market, it really does not matter. You know, the, the way to find out what the right solution is is to ask the market. So you have, you know, software and platforms out there like SurveyMonkey and Pollfish, and, and you can do qualifying questions. You know, do, are, you, are you a part of a, you know, do, do you, are you part of a music group? Do you play music, you know, on a regular basis in front of any type of an audience? Segments where you're asking the right people the right questions and identify what the main piece, the 
main problem, the biggest problem that they wanna see solved, solve that first. Because the, the, you wanna get broad distribution, you wanna build your brand, you can always evolve, you can always go to version two, add an additional feature. I mean, the, the iPhone that comes out every single year, what do they add, one additional feature? And everybody buys it, right, because they have a brand. But if you come to market with something that has all these additional features and you have to do all this education, I just think you're gonna lose people. And, and really, the, the, the biggest thing you wanna do out of the gate as a new product and a new company is just get your brand out there and get broad distribution. Um, I love the, that you talked about the, the Kager compound annual growth rate. Our box for our company, um, it has to be a minimum of 3%, um, minimum. If it's over 5%, Phenomenal, you know, really piques our interest, so I like that you highlighted that. Um, you talked about Amazon. I'm gonna ask you a question, I'm curious. Do you know what Amazon takes off every sale? Are you aware? I could not give the exact amount, but I guess between 20 and 30%. 35, 35 points on average. So if, you're, if your margin is, you know, if you start with, and I know you said, you know, 60, 65, 70%, they're very high. Now, they do offer fulfillment, which helps a lot, too, but, but that's, that's a big chunk. So, I mean, I can tell you just our organization, or our, our organization, we try to avoid Amazon um, as much as possible. I mean, I buy off Amazon all the time, so, but, but when it comes to launching a new product, there are literally companies and organizations and people that sit there, Amazon themselves, and they'll see products that sell, and they'll private label it, and they'll sell it, and it's a race to the bottom for price. So I would be cautious with that. Um, the last thing I just want to ask you, because I want to just understand it, you were talking about you know, the $2,000 development cost and the $70 sale price. Are these just numbers that you feel would work, or where are these numbers coming from? So the sale price was from the uh, $20 development price that I would anticipate, which I could go into a little bit more of a breakdown if you wanted it. But, and then I kind of looked at what margins I thought would make it worthwhile is where I got to the $70. And then for the $2,000 development costs, I was thinking through the things that me as a person would actually need. And most of the things would not be too expensive. I would honestly have that cost. I'd, I'd probably need a Mac to try stuff on because I don't currently have a Mac. So that would be a good chunk of that cost. And then for the, that can also include production costs. So a hand injection molder is a couple hundred dollars. The um, molds that you would use for the injection molder, you can actually 3D print, but that's another cost. So either have to look at getting a 3D printer that can do that or finding somebody that could 3D print it in the proper material that is thermally resistant enough for it to happen. Yeah, 3D printing is great for prototyping, but, but you're gonna have to open molds, and molds aren't a few hundred dollars. So yeah. I can tell you, injection molds are, I mean, they, they will make hundreds of thousands, millions of units, but they're, they're pricey. But I, I mean, I think you did a great job. I, I really do. I, I like you know, your, the way you communicated, your value. You're clearly very passionate about it, your knowledge about it. I would just really, you know, really focus on getting the data, putting the numbers together, but I, I like what you're doing, so good job. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Willem. Judges, are you all set? Um, at this time, we are gonna give everyone a second to stand up and stretch their legs. And before I introduce the next entrepreneur. five minutes and the iPad will be given away at the end so stay tuned
Welcome back. Hopefully you guys were able to um, have a little break. And we are going to continue with our next contestant. Um, this is an entrepreneur who has something to bring to the real estate industry. I am excited to announce Luke Reichbost. America is quickly becoming a nation of renters. With over 44 million units rented in 2021, the number has only grown with the conclusion of this past year. Of those, it's expected that about 40% oh, sorry, about 40 of these rental properties are operated by property management companies, leaving the rest, about 60%, to be operated by their owners, who on average tend to have between two to three properties for themselves. With this, it creates a vast disparity between the experiences both for renters and owners when it comes to managing a rental property. Because of this, we're able to bring about new systems into this space that are vastly needed as most people are experiencing different ways and the lacking of technology that has been brought into other aspects of our lives that COVID has, COVID has brought in for us. One area that we're able to do this and able to simplify things for people is through payments. A simple way we can go ahead and simplify things is through online specifically. By offering this, renters will be able to pay from anywhere with either their credit card, debit card, or ETF transfers directly from their bank. On top of that, we can also offer pay near me partnered locations, which allows cash payments at anywhere from Walmart, 7-Eleven, CVS, along with other locations around the nation. This easily simplifies things not only for owners and or for renters, but also for owners in the sense where owners are now able to easily plug in this data into their accounting softwares and analytics on that end. But through having things on one platform, we're also able to simplify things with screening and inspections. As you have then your utilities and everything else in one place for a unit, you can then tie your inspection photos to this one place so you can easily go back and find it instead of having to go through a paper trail of data each time you want to go ahead and check or have to do renovations. And when it comes to screenings, instead of having to wait possibly hours to days to get screenings back, you can get them back in minutes while having it specifically tied to that unit when the renter is admitted and it starts renting the unit. On top of this, because we have all the data in one place, we're able to easily create vast and very deep analytics for owners and operators to better optimize the rental properties for themselves when it comes to who to pick and what areas, along with being able to save renters themselves money. With this, we're able to far simplify many areas of an owner-operator's lives, as for the vast majority, they happen to, again, be people who have focuses other than their base properties. But for most, the biggest problem happens to be that of communication. For communication, one way that we can simplify this is having everything, again, tied to one account and have all their communication go through this base account there. As we go ahead and propose this, you can easily have it done through this base app. Through their app on their phone, you can then have communication done in one space instead of having to worry about email complications. Did my email get seen? Did my text message get seen? What's going on in their lives in this area here and all there? From it, we can also bring in new and adaptive technologies into this space as well. One example of this would be AI. We can strive and we do strive to bring in AI into the property management area by adapting this to the new possibilities we have before us. One set example would be task management. With task management, you could have a renter send in an email for a maintenance request saying that, oh, I need my leaves done because it's the fall. Have the AI automatically scan the email, see what needs to be done, and who the appropriate contractor would be, send off the appropriate request, the appropriate verified contractor, and then from there, once it's been completed, receive the bill and add the bill to your appropriate accounting. With this, you can then have your task completed to have your banking and a payment set up in minutes. It will no longer take multiple hours to get everything done in this sense. And it will then be able to save not just operators, but owners who are looking to go ahead and manage the properties themselves that we'd like to come alongside, peace of mind that is done correctly, instead of worrying about the loss of a receipt or losing of an email and communication along the way. This then also allows us to bring peace of mind to the renters in the sense where if they are able to be updated along the way, they don't have to worry that, oh, again, did my notification get seen? Is this going to happen? And when will it be coming? 
for this for our value proposition and future franchising opportunities, we're able to then come alongside current struggling property management companies and help update their systems and software as the vast majority currently, according to market research, uh, are using outdated systems like QuickBooks to do their accounting, but also, again, email or text messages. With that, on top of it, we're able to come alongside people who are interested in starting a property management company and give them the situation or the solutions and training to be able to go ahead and start it themselves, while of course taking a stake in the company, while also being able to do property management for ourselves with the standard fees. Again, for uh, franchising opportunities and coming alongside, we would take a base cut up front and then be able to charge reoccurring afterwards, either by percentage or set amount for the services that we were able to provide. When it comes to marketing of this, we're able to go ahead and use social media and content along with connections with local brokers and agents and the real estate agencies uh, to reach potential renters, while also being able to leverage national associations and chambers of commerce. From this, we're able to create the relationships necessary to further grow and further expand our reach and our influence. While we go about this and go down this line, there is a lot that needs to be done for this industry to create the experiences and the digital integration of our lives that other areas have faced in the wake of COVID. So with that, I would use the $1,000 from winning to further create and finish off the adaptive systems that I need and the trainings to be able to get this up and running. With that being said, I ask, will you join me in updating the renter's solutions? Will we be able to come together and make it a far better experience for everyone? Thank you. Okay, Luke, I didn't see any math on this. So you're saying that the revenue is gonna be generated from the property management company. They're gonna pay you for the app. So to correct the answer, I'm sorry, but we're able to charge a first base upfront fee if we're coming alongside an existing property management company. In the beginning, I do have some potentials that are interested from back home and they are playing around with the number and because I don't have any set experiences before of $3,000 to update their systems and work with them to get this ahead. When working with franchise opportunities in property management specifically, for the base and industry standard, it's about 12 to 8% if you're working with any units from one individual owner, that is between one and 10. If you have over 10 units, the industry standard there for property management tends to be that of seven to four percent. And so using that and coming alongside a property management company with the use of the systems that we have, we would then be able to charge them for the training and everything that comes along in that front. Uh, the reason I don't have any vast specific numbers is because I haven't been able to go out and I don't know what a property management company at the time being would be experiencing with that. Um, at the moment, we're playing around with 7% or so with my experiences. So you're looking at a percent of the rental to come back to you? Yes, okay. depending on what it is, unless it's coming alongside. So the, the idea here is to develop a software program, not necessarily an app, but probably an app, because you're asking for the user to interface with the property management company as well. I have software and an application completely ready to use. We're working on, with a developer friend of mine in Spain, developing the AI integration parts, but that would also be used with the $1,000. I'd probably need a bit more to get that up and running. Probably a bit more. But that would be something that would be fully finished after I'm able to go ahead and start along the line of coming alongside the ones I have set up back home. Yeah, I mean, okay, so let's go back to the concept. The concept is simple. I, both property management groups that may have a thousand different rentals, 10,000 different rentals, all the way down to an individual who I want to have a rental property, so I go out and I buy a, a duplex and I'm going to rent that. I now, as the owner, so that's very far down here, it's a thousand dollars a month, two thousand, five thousand dollars a month, I'm going to charge this rent, whatever it may be, office building space, all the thing. So I'm going to pay a percentage of that rent to you by using your software. Yes, that's technically how the industry works and how things are standardized today. So it's just based on, yeah, I can see it on a bigger level. On a smaller level, you've got one person managing one issue. If you've got 1,000 units, it's a much bigger project. It's going to come down to software development, right, and then the marketing of that software. And it's, uh, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that to execute. We're thankfully able to leverage and pull together existing softwares that are on the uh, that are out there at the moment being. So it won't cause us, and we don't have to have a very much, or a very 
fronted cost in this sense to be able to pull together the systems to need this and be able to do this ourselves. Pull together the system. So you're saying a lot of this technology already exists. There's you're a creating lot of, an API to pull it all together? Yes. Okay. Good thoughts. Interesting. Yeah, like mostly, I was saying to the guys earlier, the hardest part about this is it's all conceptualized. There's no track record behind this, you know, that type of thing. So it makes it hard. It certainly is needed. It reminds me of a point of purchase when you go to a restaurant. When I, if I want to open a restaurant, I'm not going to create the software. That's already been created. And so I'm going to buy that software, have it, push the little buttons on the screen. All that type of stuff is already created. So you're just wanting to recreate that for the property management group. Yes. Great. All right, clarity. Thank Great you. presentation. Good job, man. Seriously. Good job. Very fluid. Very good. Tell me who your audiences are. Who are you selling this? To whom are you selling what? My base audience right now um, would be property management companies back home to start things off. Okay. Along with that, I myself do have experience already from property management um, due to situations from back home. So I'm able to come alongside current property management companies to go ahead and help them update their systems and work with them to keep those systems updated, uh, further optimizing their current situation, while then also being able to come alongside people that are interested in starting a property management company that might be in the trades, that don't have the business know-how or the know of the systems to be able to do this themselves. Right, sorry, I didn't ask that question very clearly. Are you asking them to subscribe to your software and pay a monthly fee? Or are you fixing their mess? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, for coming alongside existing ones, it would be a one-time giant fee. Or right now, I'm expecting about $3,000. And then from there, you'll be able to pay a minimum monthly fee of something like $52 a month. To use your integrated system? To be able to further the system and go ahead and upkeep in that sense there. OK. Um, do you understand the term tech debt? Uh, yes, we'd be able to protect that. How is your tech debt? Through the, I'm not 100% sure of it at the top of my mind at the moment being, but uh, I know that there are ways we're able to put in place to protect the IP of that and the specific solutions that we have in put. Okay, so I know we'll get into recommendations, but I've done property management, and so you can sell a subscription, number one, to the property managers. You can sell a subscription to me because I have rentals, and I would buy that tomorrow. And then you can sell a subscription for having preferred vendors that do the work. So you think about your revenue streams being three different ways, right? And then your tech has to really work. And I'm saying the tech debt affects that massively. Mm -hmm. And so fundamentally, you need over a thousand iterations and permutations to correct that. So you can't just launch this with like 10. You, you, need, you need to work it out. Great idea. I love it. Thank you. Phenomenal presentation. You, you clearly did your homework. I love you started off with the market research. Um, that's, I mean, if you can't tell from some of my other feedback, then I'm, I'm big on that. And you, you know your market and you understand it. Um, a few things just, you know, that stuck out to me immediately is, do you know your competitors? At the moment, for those that are coming alongside current properties, property management companies, I'm sorry, along with being able to help others with these solutions, there is no one specifically in this market. There are people in the property management software market uh, with a few specific names being Buildium off the top of my head, uh, but there aren't any, again, specifically for coming alongside the people that are utilizing current solutions other than these. Um, one ex example of this is most property managers happen to be over the age of 50, and through polling done, about, I believe it was 60% or so, are not willing to update to modern solutions because, again, they're more ingrained in what they have and they're stuck in it. Right. Um, that's not the exact wording of the data itself, sure. um, but there's definitely a need as this industry evolves and goes ahead and comes forwards in the wake of the digitization for people to come alongside this area and assist them. No, great answer. Um, you know, I'd, I'll tell you that to have an all-in-one solution where you can have, you know, a one-stop shop for all of these components is very valuable. Uh, you know, I read something a couple of weeks back about how, you know, the, the, the modern entrepreneur uses all of these different apps and plugins and APIs, and, and our company does, you know, I can name probably seven or eight different solutions that we use. And so to have all, everything that you need to operate your business uh, in one, one central program or application is very valuable. Um, it makes what you, what you would call the, the terminology is sticky, right? You want it to be sticky. Um, I want, I, I'm not a fan of the upfront fee 
at all. I think the valuations from an ARR and MRR um, perspective are going to be much higher. I mean, you can have 15 or 20 times uh, on your EBITDA um, on, on when it comes to, you know, the recurring revenue. So a SaaS model, software as a service, I think that's a much more, va much more valuable approach to this. Um, I think one of the challenges um, is really just going to be able to determine uh, the ROI. Because when, when you're going to do a pitch and you're going to have to be able to be able basically tell someone this is going to save you X amount of dollars, you pay this person X amount of dollars a year, and this would pretty much eliminate the need for that, you know, that, that overhead and, and everything would be in one central location. Um, so those were some of my initial thoughts. Um, in terms of you, you're talking about going to property management companies, I would really encourage you to look at be more specific about that. You know, property management companies, you have, in, in my office building, we have Graystar. You know, Graystar's tremendously large, huge company. Uh, I think that companies like that are more likely to have their own proprietary platform. I think they probably do. So when you're going to kind of smaller organizations, I think that you, you probably would be able to determine an ROI a lot quicker, just my, my opinion. Um, you know, the beautiful thing about software is, is that it, it's a very heavy upfront expense, right? But once you have it developed, yes, it does require maintenance. Yes, you're going to need upgrades and updates. But for the most part, you know, it's, it's a cash cow, you know, because it's, it's developed. So um, there's a lot of value in that, but not with the upfront cost, with, with, the, with the recurring revenue and keeping it sticky into where. Because you want to make it more difficult for people to transition away than to stay with your platform, right? I mean, that, that's, that's the whole concept. But, and the last thing I wanna say, you, you talked about some of your business development initiatives. Man, um, when I got into business, 18 years old, you know what I used? It wasn't mobile, but this. And, and I would encourage young people to pick up the phone and make phone calls. I mean, digital marketing is very valuable, but there's nothing more valuable than getting someone on the phone, having a conversation, um, and, and talking to people, or walking and knocking on doors. And, and so, you know, that, that's one thing I would encourage is just, you know, be a dog on a bone and, and, you know, go after people. Every no brings you closer to a yes, and that tenacity, you know, it's gonna build character, and, uh, and it's, gonna, it's gonna be very rewarding. You know, if you do what other people aren't willing to do, you're going to have what other people aren't going to have. So that's my feedback. I know, I know we're out of time, but I want to tell you that Blackstone and J.P. Morgan Chase are going to be the largest homeowners and rental properties in the next two years. They're going to buy more than $200 billion worth of real estate. That's their play. So that might be another market. Of course, and thank you. Great job, Luke. Um, we are on to our last contestant of the night. And this contestant, this team, has put together something that would definitely be used on Cedarville's campus and is probably something that you all are potentially involved in currently or have done in the past. It is my privilege to introduce Carissa Smith to present her assassins. Hello, my name is Carissa Smith, and I am proud to present to you the Assassin's App, a better way to play a classic game. Now this app is brought to you by a team of software engineers, Dillian, myself, Hannah, and Henry. Now, I know that most of you are fairly familiar with assassins, but not everybody is. So, I will explain what assassins is. It's a very active group game in which players are assigned unique targets and they go around with the very deadly plastic spoon and assassinate their target. And targets in the group are arranged by a moderator or an organizer, such that every player has unique targets, and these targets form a chain from all the players. So once you kill somebody, their target is now your next target, and so on, until there's only one person left in the game, because everybody else has killed other targets. That person is the winner. So this game is a fairly simple one. 
why do we need an app for it? Well, I'm going to tell you a story, and it's a story that's not entirely hypothetical. We have a youth pastor. Let's call him Josh. Josh is running a game night for some middle and high school students at his church. And he's got some Nerf guns. He's got a decent number of Nerf guns. And he's got free reign of the entire church building. So he figures, we can play assassins with Nerf guns. I can have my students you know, assign targets and shoot each other, take each other out. So he'd like to set up a game of assassins. The first thing he has to do is he has to get all of the names of his kids. After that, he has to randomly assign all of them targets, such that you have one continuous chain of assassin target, assassin target, assassin target. And not, you know, these three people over here are all each other's targets and the rest of everybody else is uh, a different link. And this is much more of a problem when you're doing it by hand on the spot, like Josh is. After Josh creates this random list of targets, Josh has to secretly take each student aside and tell him or her who his or her target is. And then Josh sets them free and they can go play assassins. But there's one remaining problem, which is the kids like Josh and they really just want to shoot him with a Nerf gun. But Josh can't play because Josh knows the entire target chain. That wouldn't be fair. So how can we fix this problem? With an app. With an Assassin's app, Josh can just create a game and let all of his students join it with a code. The app can then randomize and assign targets for him instantaneously. He could even play himself, and he'd have moderator powers so that uh, the one kid who always cheats, because unfortunately, even in youth groups, it happens. And that one kid who always cheats could be killed when he's supposed to be. Some other benefits of this app is that you can have this short form assassins game. Um, most of the games we play on Cedarville's campus are longer form assassins games. The person who has a list of targets gets to um, send emails out at a designated later time. The game's played over a couple weeks. But in Josh's example, he's playing it in a short time span. So this app allows that to happen. It also provides notifications for game events and player deaths, um, which usually you would have like a group chat for that or something. It also has profile pictures. So I'm fairly recognizable. I think it's the hair. But I want to know who my target is. Maybe I've never even met them before. I don't want to be like, oh yeah, everybody knows that's Carissa. You can go get her. She's right there. And you know, my target, yeah, I have no idea what they look like. And, you know, I'm willing to bet that some of you don't play assassins as often as you could just because you're like, yeah, I don't know enough people. I don't want to have to look for some random person I've never heard of. And because there's also an app with this, there's an opportunity for periodic updates with more quality of life features and other fun twists to the game. So... Who plays assassins? I think we've gone over this answer a little bit. You know, a lot of youth groups, potentially high school, middle school, college, lots of college. Many of Cedarville's orgs, student orgs, host a game of assassins every semester, potentially every year. Um, who's heard of the campus-wide assassins game going on right now? Yeah, that's, that's a funny coincidence, isn't it? So, uh, the main group of people who play assassins is probably college students. I would like to invite my teammate Dillian up to talk us through a video demo of the app. All right, I'll apologize for the, the, for the video because it's a little too fast, but it's been done because of uh, time. So if you could play the video, please. All right, so here, this is the sign-in page where you can sign in with Google, and then there's the home page. And at the bottom, you have a, a join game tab where you'll be able to go to create game. And there, you'll be able to put the name of the game and then have some rules on it. At the bottom, you will all be able to, to see if you want to show profile pictures and show notifications. Once that, you'll be taken to the game page where you'll be able to, to see 
um, the join code and be able to have two options to start the game or delete the game. Once you get another player, you'll have um, the next screen, which is say your target and then a profile picture. And then it will also have a kill button where you can click it and kill your person. Then as you can also can see, uh, once your target kills you, you'll have a pop-up that'll say um, your assassin has killed you, confirm or deny. Once you hit confirm, you're dead and out of the game. So once you do that, you go back and it says Steven is the winner in this example. And that's how we're implementing the app. We would have liked to do a live demo of all of that for you. And we could have if we had been able to get tech plugged in properly, which they told us was not you know, something that we were going to be able to do at this venue. But we actually have run several beta tests of this app quite successfully. So uh, what would it take to start this project? Well, the first $100 has to go to an Apple developer license. We can only currently test this app on Android phones at large scale um, because you have to pay $100 to be able to put anything on the Apple App Store. Uh, the next $400 would go towards furthering development and design. And the $500 advertising budget is necessary to get a critical mass of students using this on a college campus such that incoming freshmen are motivated to get the app as well. Um, in terms of a fi financial model for this app, the cost of maintaining this app is $100 for the Apple developer license every year, and then less than a dollar per user per year. So we obviously need to sell this app. Unfortunately, people are used to apps being free. The biggest reason for this is because apps get their revenue from selling your data. That's an option that we would like to be able to take off the table and not do. But as a result, we have to have the app on the App Store for a certain flat fee. Or potentially, we could work it out so that people who host a game pay for the app. And then anybody who just wants to participate in the Assassin's game can get it for free, possibly with ads or other such things. And that is all. Thank you. Well, my initial thought on this was this would work. That was my initial thought. The four of you taking the time to do the programming, do you have the, do you have the ability and the skill level needed to manage that yourself? Absolutely. Because that's the big cost, right? You're going to have ongoing costs associated with that. The $500 for the acquisition cost of a client, that's not even close. You guys already know that, though. So if you're going to get people onto the app, it's going to have, how are you, what's your customer acquisition cost? That's going to be analyzed. The idea of it being free and it being viral probably is your best projection. So if you guys can manage it in-house and create it and make it successful, I'm guessing the largest majority of these, these guys right out here would download it, play it, and then use it. The other thing I saw that you didn't mention, and I'm sure you've already thought of that, is if someone is terminated, they can re-enter a new game. It's no different than someone playing the video games they play. Once they're dead, they got shot, they stop, and they re-enter a game with five oh, other yeah. people. Or Actually, 20. you can be part of multiple games at one time, which the app can totally do. You can be have. part of multiple, people, multiple yes. games at the exact same time. Yes. I would just say it'll work. I, I really believe this would work. No questions about it. Um, how do you market it? What is the cost associated with that? Online advertising that can tie into that can then build your revenue. If I don't want the ads, I can opt out. I'm sure there's thoughts in your head with things like, well, maybe you could develop these thoughts. Like, how do I get someone to pay for it? Because there's upgrades in everything. Uh, I don't know if it's people's faces. I don't know if that's a part of it when you initially start. Because like you said, anybody can identify you, Carissa. But maybe there's a blind function where you have to figure out who it is I'm trying to assassinate versus compare to, let me give you their profile and what they look like and where they shop and where they eat and all that goes along with that. So the data that you're getting uh, can be beneficial. So if you want more data on how to kill him, uh, you can pay for that. I mean, there's a lot of things that could go along with that. But I think uh, things that would help you the most is the fact that if you guys truly have the skill to develop it, you guys can sit in there and code it. And then you could, you're, you're, they're not even close to the co customer acquisition cost to getting it out there. But so the viral elements of social media can help you. And uh, it's a great starting point. Excellent, excellent job. Tell me a little bit about the scalability of the revenue. What's the end game? So 
the purpose of this app is to provide students uh, a way to play assassins together more easily at a reasonable cost. Um, so the ideal place where we want this app to be is where we're making enough revenue to cover continued development and updates to the app. Um, that's going to be a little bit of time before we get there, most likely just because if we have only a small base of people using the app, the Apple developer license is going to eat up a large chunk of. Right, I'd encourage you to think through your revenue stream and think in, um, if there are four of you, how much money do you wanna make a year? Multiply that times four, and that's how much you have to get out of the app. So, you know, you could charge a dollar per occurrence and get 30,000 students doing an instance right now and make $30,000 the next hour, right? So think in a different model relative to not just subscription base or game base, but you could think in an instance case, even 50 cents an instance, right? Most of these guys got that, right? So think about that. I wanna learn a little bit more about your server security because you're asking me to give you permission to get on my phone. Tell me about your, the sophistication of your server security. Um, security of what in particular? Data. data, data security. Data security. So some of the data we have is your email that you sign in with. Um, that's actually handled within some Google server authentication features. Uh, we actually have minimal or no access to your account itself. Um, and Google is protecting most of your data there. Right, I understand most that. But I can hack your app and get all the data. So you have to figure out a way to block that. It's a pretty common third party for me to go around Google and get into your app and integrate it and steal the data. So the server sophistication that you have, you can't just go through Google, you gotta go around that. You tracking with me? No, I'm not sure what you mean, I'm sorry. We can talk afterwards. Okay. So, when I was younger, um, I'm not a big gamer, I'll start out by saying that. Uh, nope, not an assassin. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was a kid, we, we played outside. And I know that that's something that, that doesn't happen so much um, in today's generation. A lot of generation plays games, and so you capitalize on that, and that's just the world we live in. And so um, I, I like what you're doing. Uh, you didn't mention this, but I, you seem very bright, so I'm, I'm, think, I'm sure you've, you've thought about this. This would be the tip of the iceberg in terms of a proof of concept. I, I see this as a way to bring community, right? The way I used to go out in my neighborhood and play with, with other kids in the neighborhood, football, hockey, whatever it is, that was a sense of community. Now people do it through video games. So you're, you're basically providing this environment, ecosystem, where people can engage you know, digitally. Right, and, and so I like that. You're focused on, on one game, which again is that proof of concept initially. Uh, do you have any ideas of how this could scale to other games? Have you thought about that? Or are we just focused on Assassins and that's the only game we're, we're looking at? No, Assassins is the only game we're looking at. And I would actually disagree with saying that this is an online community. Assassins is a game that must be played in person. I believe okay. that this is the way people should use their phones is as a tool towards face-to-face -face interaction and not as a place to escape and run away from people. And Assassins okay. is a great game that can be automated using phones, but not. I didn't know it was an in, in person. I, I actually yeah. asked Dan while you were talking about it, I asked him, I said, is this a video game? And <laughs> he told me yes, so I, I didn't know. Um, yeah, I, I, no. I don't, okay, I, I didn't know what it was, so That's, I apologize. That was a lack of, lack of understanding. Um, the, as far as the revenue model, so I would, I would encourage, and I, I think Earl talked a little bit about this, is, is it's called freemium. Um, that's the, the, when it comes to apps. So you start out with the free model, you know, you get a bunch of downloads, you get a bunch of, you know, people to engage with it and start to use it on a regular basis. And as they use it, and you know, as annoyed as they might be, you start to run ads and you make people watch the ads and if they want to skip the ads and they pay two ninety nine a month or what have you. Um, and that's kind of ways to, to start to generate revenue, but obviously having it be free, lowest barrier to entry, really get it out there. Um, I like you know, that, that your target market is universities. It's really easy, word of mouth, friends, people that are very close quarters. I think that is really your target market. It seems you guys have done a great job in terms of developing this. Um, yeah, I, the, the other thing that I would say, and, and this is probably something you were looking at as well, uh, would be really to try to gamify it a little bit as well. I didn't see anything about kind of leaderboards or badges or anything like that. I think if you gamify it, there's this competitive spirit within people 
to want to be the best. And, you know, just because you take out one person doesn't make you the best, right? So there's, I, I didn't see anything about that. I'm sure that you probably thought about yeah, that. Or in, if you haven't, in the back occurred. end, we're tracking things like your kills. And we intend to put those in the front end and show, you know, okay, Perfect. so they may have won the game, but who got like 17 kills over here? Right. Right, leaderboard, it's like, you know, golden tee. I don't know if anybody plays golden tee, but you, know, you always want to get that low score or the, the closest to the pen. And, you know, so people spend hours trying to do that. It's that competitive nature. But um, you clearly know your stuff. Um, I don't know a lot about this space, but you do. And uh, that was very clear. So good job. Can we have one more round of a hand for all of our contestants tonight? At this time, the judges are gonna be able to discuss the winners and um, I am going to introduce our advisor for putting on the pitch event, Dr. Daryl Smith. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, while the judges are tallying their results and figuring their different numbers, I have been uh, very blessed to be the faculty advisor for this event this evening, and the team that put it together did a wonderful job. Could we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> while the judges are figuring, I just wanted to pull the curtain back a little bit and look at the behind the scenes of what's going on tonight. Uh, we have seen some very creative and innovative ideas displayed tonight. Where did those come from? Well, actually, the scriptures have the answer for that for us. The very first book of the Bible, the first two chapters, called the book of Genesis, describes how God made everything. From the eagle soaring across the sky to the thoroughbred horse racing across the meadow, to the unbelievable innovative design of the human body. Just think, when we cut ourselves, our body automatically heals itself. That is an amazing design. But we as a uh, humans with this wonderful design body have some big problems. If you've turned on the news recently, you realize that uh, we have trouble in our world. Where did that trouble come from? Well, also the scripture gives us that answer. It's our sin and our rebellion against God's ways. I know we like to think that we're good, and at some level we are, but deep down we know that we're flawed and we're not perfect, and we've all done things that we're ashamed of. So how does a holy God who loves the creatures he created dearly, deal with that because just people don't let guilty people go off scot-free. Well, God actually came up with a very innovative solution at a very high price. God himself put on human flesh and came to this earth as a man named Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life. And what did human beings do to the only perfect person who ever lived? We crucified him. But on that cross, he was actually paying the punishment that I deserve and that you deserve for our rebellion against God. And then three days later, he came back to life, validating the fact that he indeed was God himself. So the good news for you and I, with our deepest problem being our sin and rebellion, that God, the ultimate creator, came up with an innovative solution. All we need to do is to turn from ourselves, and we like to follow ourselves, don't we? At least I like to follow myself. We turn from ourself, we cry out to God for forgiveness for our rebellion, believing that Jesus paid that penalty that we owed. And in grateful response to him, we give our life to him for what he's done for us. 
And we do, when we do that, we find the peace and the hope and the forgiveness that we're so desperately seeking. So God, the ultimate creator, with the ultimate innovative solution to our deepest problems. What an amazing creator that we have. As we finish up this evening, we want to focus our attention on some other creative and entrepreneurial efforts occurring here at Cedarville. And with that, I'd like Eve Weldner to come up. Eve is one of our wonderful freshman students at Cedarville University. Can we give Eve a round of applause? Come on up, Eve. She also did much to make tonight happen, so thank you, Eve. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Eve Wellner. Um, on behalf of the Startup Society, I would like to thank each and every one of you uh, for coming out tonight and supporting Cedarville University's growing entrepreneurship program. The Startup Society is Cedarville's new up-and-coming entrepreneurship club uh, that will encourage students uh, to come together and create as God initially intended and created us to do from the very beginning. The students in the club will be able to build skills that are essential uh, for building a successful startup in the real world. They'll also be able to learn from and network with uh, real life entrepreneur entrepreneurs uh, with experience in the market. Uh, we envision the Startup Society to be a place where students can learn and grow together and also that they can um, talk to each other about their ideas and, about, and receive constructive criticism for them. If you are in engineering, nursing, business, or any other major and you have a startup idea, I strongly encourage you to... Um, I strongly encourage you to be on the lookout for more details about the Startup Society in the upcoming weeks. But in the meantime, if you could follow uh, the Startup Society on Instagram at CU underscore Startup Society. I repeat, that's CU underscore Startup Society. Um, and just look for more details. Thank you. On another exciting note for this evening, I'm about to announce the winner of the Apple iPad. All right. The winner is Emma Baggin. So if Emma Baggin, if you could come up to the front and receive your prize. Congratulations. All right, and I'm gonna direct uh, the floor to Christian, who will be announcing the winners of The Pitch 2023. Thank you. As we wait a few moments for the judges to make their final decision, we really are curious, what is the cleanest bathroom on campus? Quickly shout it out for us. Do you hear HSC? What floor? Third floor? I think that's the nursing floor, so that makes sense. Especially the guy's bathroom on that floor. Yeah. With that being said, we'd like to give a huge thanks to the Plaster School of Business, um, Dean Heyman and Dr. Daryl Smith, uh, for making this possible, along with our judges from the Christian Business Fellowship. Um, with Scott Moffitt and uh, Dan Perry and Earl Seals, we appreciate it. Um, and with that being said, are we ready to learn of tonight's winners? All righty. Coming in fourth place and going home with $200, would you please give it up for Cooper Peterson and his new innovative gloves? Next up, coming in third place with a new innovation to MIDI data, please give it up to Willem Vandermeer and MIDI and Prime. With just two prizes left, coming in second place with a new innovation that should go right into business in Cedarville, would you give it up for Dillian Munoz and Carissa Smith with the Assassin's App.
Thank you. And then we'll get our first kiss after this one. All righty. And who wants to learn who wins the $1,000? Coming in first place, would you please give Luke Reichbos and Prime Property? We just want to give a huge thank you to all you guys for coming out on this Saturday night. Enjoy your evening. I'm Christian Epic.